today we are in for a visual treat as our guest is Louis Dante a highly accomplished animator who has worked on games like Horizon Zero Dawn Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 Tear Away Farm Hero Super Saga and more in this episode we learn from Louis about what a day in the life of a game animator looks like let's dive into the episode hello and welcome folks i'm thrilled to have an old friend with me today on this podcast Let me introduce to you Luis Dante. Luis is from Barcelona, Spain. He is a senior animator with 16 years of experience and he's working as senior cinematic animator at Treyarch in Los Angeles in US. And Luis has previously worked with King Image Engine Design in Gorilla Games Media Molecule. Luis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you Shiraj, thank you very much for having me here. This is a great opportunity to reconnect with you. Thank you. So excited to have you here. And Luis, you are one of my favorite animators and you have inspired me in many many ways. I feel very fortunate to have shared a bit of my career history with working with you on the days at King, but you have had a very vast work experience before King and after King as well. So I'm just interested to know like could you briefly tell about your career journey, like what were the milestones that helped you reach to where you are today for sure well i hope we have enough time because it's it's quite long so yeah let's get started i mean i've been animating professionally i think around 16 years now so it's been a while um i started on small things in barcelona working for the national television uh like tiny tv series then i jumped to axis animation Uh, this is in Scotland. I was working as, as a character animator, working on cinematics. All these intros that you see in the video games at the beginning of the video game that are pre-rendered, we were doing all that stuff. There was really talented people there, and yeah, that I think opened the opportunity to other bigger studios. One of them was Polygon Pictures in Japan, in Tokyo. They offered me a position there. Uh, I've always been a fan of the Japanese culture, all the animation, all the manga. So that was basically a a dream come true. So I took the opportunity, moved to Tokyo, spent there a bit more than a year. By the way, I survived to a nuclear crisis in Fukushima, <laughs> which is a memory that I will always carry in my, in my heart. Um so yeah, uh, I was I was in Japan, I worked for different TV shows. Um that, that would be for instance Throne Up Rising. Uh, it's a series that by the way is are directed by Alberto Miel, Mielgo, very famous now, but not so famous back then. Uh, I also work on Transformers, the TV, uh, TV series, and I always say that I learned to animate in Japan, and it's true because for for that brief period of time, which was a year, a year and a half in in Tokyo, I animated a lot, and I, some of my style shows that Japanese anime influence because I I learned a lot there. Um, so after that, that year, I got the opportunity to work on my first uh, feature film. That was in Granada. It was a movie produced by Antonio Banderas. It was called Justin and the Knights of Valor. And yeah, feature film, right? That's what all the animators aim for. Uh, you want to work on a feature film because that's where you can produce the highest quality animation. Um, we did that. Uh, the movie didn't have much success. I think that visually it was very interesting. Like artistically, it was very interesting. But it, it was one of these projects that ends up being very watered down because there's so many interests it needs to show this it needs to show that and it lost a little bit the uh, you know like the genuine genuinity that, that should should have had um so yeah visually very interesting but in terms of box sales uh, not not very successful um so after that moved to england to work for media molecule uh for this super interesting project uh tear away i didn't know uh, by the time I, i moved there a lot about the project but once there uh yeah i start i start getting acquainted with all the rest of the artists know about the game know about the studio culture which is incredible and yeah it's probably one of the best places that i've ever worked media molecule super interesting very creative uh, space uh and the games that they do they're just gorgeous right um especially tear away with all this origami style uh yeah i have super good memories of media molecule then i i i also work for a year in dreams i don't know if you know about this game it's uh, based on user generated content 
very ambitious game. The, the company was probably nine years working on it. But I felt that in the way that I could help with Tearaway, I couldn't help with Dreams. Uh, so yeah, I could no longer feel that I had that impact that I had in Tearaway with that game. So I decided to move uh, to Amsterdam to Guerrilla Games. Uh, that was 2014. Yeah, to work on Horizon. Uh, I don't need to explain anybody about Horizon. Uh, thankfully, it has become like a super successful franchise. I couldn't be any more happier for Guerrilla. When we were working on it, on the first one, we weren't that sure <laughs> if, it, if it would be successful or not. Uh, but yeah, it has turned out an incredible game. Guerrilla has grown so much. And I have some of my best friends still working there. So yeah. Also, Amsterdam is such an incredible and fun place to, to live and work. Um, so after that, I moved to Vancouver. Getting back, you know, after these years working in games, it was like four or five years, I, really, I was really missing a bit of PFX, uh, like um, CG, proper CG animation, working for, for film. So I got the opportunity to work on a Final Fantasy movie. Uh, you know, I remember as a kid uh, seeing Spirits Within and, and thinking that that was the best movie I've ever seen in my life. And all of a sudden I had the opportunity to, to work on one of, of these Final Fantasy movies, right? So I left everything and, and went straight to Vancouver to Image Engine, which are, by the way, it's the studio that produced the visual effects uh, from Neil Blomkamp, uh, District 9 and all these movies. So yeah, it was also a dream come true to, to work with these people. Um, I was there for a year, then some personal things happened and I, I returned to, to Barcelona and that's where I met you, <laughs> working at King in mobile uh, mobile games. Uh, King, it's be, it was a, was a ride actually. Uh, it's, it's the place that I worked longer in my, in my life uh, for five years. I only have good words for everyone working at King. The energy is fantastic. The city, Barcelona, it's my city. What else can I say? It's a fantastic city. So it was a super happy time in my life during these five years. I got married. I met the person that I love. Uh, so yeah, really good memories about my time at King. And right now I'm speaking from California. I'm living in Los Angeles. I got hired by Treyarch working on the next Call of Duty. So this has been my career journey, like super, 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 super quick. Amazing. And what an amazing journey, by the way. And I have known your work, but now when I heard the entire timeline, I can connect all those locations you have been and your career move and how they have influences your result of your animation. So now I can, I can see those inspiration from all those locations and also the projects that you've been into. So th that, that's great to know. One thing which I want to know from you is, Every artist or every art director like uh, would be doing something very different in one company versus another company. So I believe the same goes for animator, like an animator working in a mobile game or even a puzzle game, like a subgenre would be doing something very different compared to someone who's working on like a console game with a very, um, very hardcore gameplay or whatever. But still, could you like cramp that in into explaining about what does a typical day in a life of an animator or maybe a, your typical day looks like? What's your workflow? Who creates the requirement? Who decides the constraint? Who reviews your animations? And how does the QA testing work? Like basically explain me your workflow and how it, how it goes in, in your day life uh, overall. Sounds good. So yeah, we can, as you well pointed, so there's like animation for games, animation for TV series, animation for uh, VFX artists, animation for movies. Each one has a slightly different pipelines or workflows. Uh, I think that it's interesting. We can focus this into video games, which is what I'm doing now. So my typical day, it, it kind of changes in games. You are, you are used to different things, but usually when we start on a new animation, everything starts with a design doc. So yeah, that's like the game designers. Let's say that they want to create a new, for instance, I've been working now with AI which are the enemies that you're going to find in the zombie enemies that you're going to find. They have like different class of AI archetypes. Uh, so they are, they want to create a new, a new enemy. Okay. So they come up with a, basically a word document explaining very quickly, uh, what's the description of the character, like his special attacks, blah, blah. So you have a, a rough, it's really a rough description of the character. And based on that, you start 
thinking on ideas. Hey, how could you make that work? I mean, the first thing that I usually do, even before the hitting the computer, is do some rough storyboards. You know, I have a, a, a notebook like this one, and I always draw a little bit. That helps me understand even before shooting references. So to organize ideas in my mind, um, that's how I start. Then uh, once you have uh, you, the animation that you're going to um, you're going to work on clear. What I do is I shot a lot of references of myself. So with the videos, I shot references acting out if it's a jump or if it's a swipe or a melee attack. And I also do a lot of research on on YouTube. I always say the reference is 50% of your animation, right? And it's something that is going gonna, is gonna to speed up so much the process. So when you hit, when you open Maya, when you open the scene or whatever software you're using, you know exactly what you're going to do. You don't need to explore and 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 look for things in, inside Maya. You already know what you're going to do. So that's what I do. I prepare very well my animation, jump into Maya, prepare the first blocking. First blocking would be like an, a schematic, like an, a skeleton of the, of the animation. And that's what I upload. We use SyncSketch, for instance, at Treyarch, which is like a platform where every animator uploads um, different videos and it can be reviewed. So that's what I do. I upload... Uh, a blocking and my supervisor, my lead, my other, it's, it, it, everyone has a say really. Uh, traditionally, it's the director uh, and uh, the lead, but everyone has a say on, on your animation uh, in, in this studio. Uh, so I recollect some feedback and based on that, I come up with the next iteration. Okay, so basically this is very similar to how it looks like in, in cinema or feature films, except that in games we have one, one last step, which is implementation. Okay, so your animation might look good. The Maya, your play blast might look very good, but the, the animation looks needs to feel great in game. Okay, and then depending on the company you are working on, this process in some companies an engineer implements the animation. In some other companies, you are the responsible for the implementation, um, and that's one of the big difference with uh, really films that uh, the animation needs to look good inside inside of a game, and it usually takes a lot of time. You know, to get it right, because something that you have the feeling that would work in Maya, then when you see it in game, it's not responsive, it needs to be faster. And it's a discussion that needs to occur also with the game designers. So the designers are going to look at this animation. It's like, no, it's not conveying what we, um, the idea that we pretend. Or for instance, everything looks good. Then you can submit the animation. It's in game. Forget about it. And then QA comes to you. Uh, QA is quality assurance. So. Uh, these are the guys that are constantly playing the game, trying to f to break it basically to see if they if they find bugs. Uh, and they would come to you as like, look, uh, look, Louis, this animation here. When I turn right, blah blah, the neck of the character breaks, and you're like, ah. so back to the drawing board. So there's, I would say that the biggest difference in games is precisely that. There's like a technical part that if you work in feature film, you don't get to see. So in a way. You are, a, you are an animator, but you are also a developer. You need to fight with some programs. You don't need to know how to code, but you, you need to get your hands a bit more dirty with uh, with different files and things like this. This would be this would be my typical day at work. Awesome, got it. Um, so uh, just to summarize what I understood, I start from a design document, and then you take it up from there. You pull up your sketchbook. You plan your storyboard. You plan how the camera is going to act what you're going to compose into the scene, and then you basically go into production. So you start maybe like a more like a previous test to start with, but then you refine and have a more quality animation completed. And then it's also like once it's done, it gets reviewed with SyncSketch and more people can give feedback. And then eventually it's uh, maybe you implementing or someone else implementing depending on what the workflow is. Uh, amazing. But is there, apart from this, this section of the working game development, do you as an animator influence any other aspect of the art pipeline? For example, character creation or stylistic decisions, uh, because that can influence the animation also. And also, if you are not doing VFX, then you uh, you contribute towards VFX or even, for example, voice voiceovers or music or anything of those things. Yeah. So uh, uh, again, it depends on the studio and it depends on the nature of the of your product. I, f I feel that in video games, there's more influence between departments, more cross cross collaboration. Uh, usually, in in films, 
all that you get handed is a storyboard and you need to animate that exactly as it looks on the storyboard or the layout or the previous. Uh, particularly the studio that I'm working on right now. Yes, as animators, we influence a lot of character design. I'm gonna, I'm just, I'm go just gonna give you an example. So uh, uh, two years ago, when we started on this game, uh, all the animators uh, came up with ideas with new of new characters, right? New enemies. It was just prototyping, and it was something internal that we did in the animation department. Uh, those were so good that our director uh, decided to show them to character design and design, and they loved it. You know, and they loved it. And one of the uh, uh, was lucky enough that one of my proposals is gonna make it into the game. So how awesome is that? Right? So yes, uh, in in brief, yes, we we can influence other other departments uh, in animation, and that's how it should be. Because at, at the end of the day, an animator creates characters, right? The thing is, like nowadays, it has become so compartmentalized. Everything that seems that you can only animate, right? But uh, yeah, I think. I think that uh, we should, uh, not only as animators, the rest of the artists composing a studio, they should try to influence other areas and, uh, you know, like the people on top should value that and should foster that. Got it. And the, the one thing which I've seen most collaboration coming from, from animators and the, the most common people that they interact with are technical artists. And I don't know whether you as a, as a person are also a technical artist yourself. I believe you were uh, able to write some script by yourself, but let's say there's a department for technical artists and they are supporting you here. So could you describe a bit more about what that, that kind of like work relationship works between a technical artist and an animator? What do they provide to you, which enable you to have better results on animation, for example? So traditionally, a technical artist in the scene of video game creation i will i will oversimplify simplify now but traditionally a technical artist it's a rigger right uh, so it's somebody that knows a lot uh a technical an, an animation technical artist is usually a rigger it's somebody that uh grabs the model of a character adds all the bones creates all the controls that then it's handed to us animators who animate that character, right? Yeah, th this is how it works. Yeah, then there's other, uh, in other companies, uh, there's other definitions of, of technical artists which are more broad. For instance, a technical artist can even take care of some effects, you know, or it's somebody that uh, codes a lot as well. But uh, the definition I'm f I feel comfortable with is basically a rigger, which is, you know, rigger and animator are yin and yang. They they hate each other, but they need each other. You know? It's like, it's a beautiful relation. and. Uh, yeah, some of my best friends are, are riggers and I love them so much, but we live, we live this relation very passionately and very intensely. Amazing. Let's talk about challenges. So what are the most common challenges a game animator experiences? Uh, are there things like shortage of time or technical limitations or some poor execution on the asset production side or even the feedback system and the multiple people giving micro feedback? Uh, what are the typical challenges? So as far as my the projects that I work on, I would say time, it's never been a challenge, you know, just because the nature of the video game projects, it's uh, much longer in time compared to feature film. Okay, so you need to animate a feature film in six months, basically. And there's games that maybe you'll be working on that game in five years, you know, it, you work along five years. So yeah, time... Although it can get challenging towards the launch date, obviously, we all know that. Uh, usually it's much better, uh, the time management in games, at least for my experience. Uh, challenges. Challenges that you have in, in games, uh, it's that uh, you need to talk to people, basically. It's not like feature films where you get handed a shot or a sequence of these shots. In video games, you need to make systems work, okay? And systems usually involve like sound, design, uh, engineering. So that's an incredible challenge. It's like you need to talk a lot to people, align people about this feature. And yeah, it's, it's something that doesn't really happen, at least for me when I work in films, it doesn't really happen. This is an incredible challenge. It can be stressful. Uh, you know, people has very strong feelings in, uh, in every department. Uh, but when you pull off something and you sit in game and you see it working, it's like, 
it suddenly comes alive, right? It's an incredible feeling that uh, all these people have worked in this feature and it's there and it, and it's done. So that's an important challenge about video games. Um, what else could I tell you? Yeah, I would say I would say getting all the departments aligned and yeah, uh, creating a, a a feature together. I think it's it's one of the big difference between feature films and the, the, one of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, game game development is very collaborative, and you have to talk a lot to everyone. <laughs> so I agree hundred percent. Yeah, send me a Jira, and uh, <laughs> did you see the Jira? Create the Jira all the time with Jira. Jira is the ticketing system that many uh, many studios use, right? To to track and follow the different bugs and the different tasks. So yeah, so. You've been animating for many years, and uh, I'm just curious more on the tools and technology side. Has things changed in any way from the processes of tools and what they were able to offer before versus what you're able to use now from your main tool, for example, Maya, to some extra plugins that make your job easier, for example, or even better motion capture and things like these, like that has improved and that's making your work easier? So for like... So I my field of expertise is keyframe, keyframe animation, so creating animation from scratch, you know, with Maya. Um, it hasn't changed that much, you know, since uh, since I started, as I said, fifteen years ago. It's basically it's basically the same. It's true that there's like some things that have appeared that I can comment on now. This is a bit more detailed, but I think it's fine for this type of. Of talk, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, for instance, one thing that everyone is on today in, in terms of animation with Maya is Animbot. It's like this um, this set of plugins. Before in Maya, you you had to grab uh, different tools to different things from different places, right? Now you get a license of Animbot, and basically you have all the tools you ever need in a sidebar in Maya, perfectly. These tools have helped. Um, they help my day to day, and I know that. For many other people, uh, they help as well. And this has been a good push. Things like, for instance, there's this plugin that is called Ragdoll Dynamics. Um, this is like a tool that exists in Maya that was developed two, three years ago. And it keeps improving and it's to animate all the secondary motion and much more than that. But the way you use it is, for instance, a character has some hair and it has some, a, a chain of bones. So you apply Ragdoll Dynamics and you get the you get all the animation for free. Uh, almost for free. Uh, what else? Things like, for instance, the uh, uh, the accent suits, as you were mentioning, mockup, right? So now, nowadays, before, like twenty years ago, you really needed a specialized space for uh, capturing um, mockup data. It's been quite a while that uh, you are, right now. You there's like these suits, as I was saying, they are called accents. It's just like a like a web like a frog suit that you put on, and you can capture anywhere, right? And the data is it, it comes really really nice. So things like this, and then something that has definitely made animation advance is how easy it is nowadays to get a reference. You know, so imagine the days of Disney, the Beauty and the Beast, for the animators to take references of themselves dancing or whatever it is. They they were doing that. But of course, you need to shoot it on a camera, put it on the video recorder, like uh, edit it, get a, a digital. So imagine how complicated was the process nowadays. Is only take your phone, shoot a video, pass it on on the computer. So and I, I really think that the, uh, the how easy it has become to access to references to YouTube and how easy it has become to shoot references of yourself. This has made advanced so much uh, animation. Got it. Cool. And you mentioned uh, taking references and recording yourself. So when I remember the days when, when we happened to work together, I remember your workflow where you would get up from your chair and you'll perform acting of whatever stuff that you are animating. It could sometimes be even an object behavior to a cartoon character and then you, um, you recorded yourself and then you took uh, a lot of reference on it. And I mean, I, I know the reasons for why to do why you do that and why an animator does it. But just to emphasize the importance of acting here for our audience, so so that the the people who are enthusiastic for working as an animator can understand why does it like such a simple step and something that can be overlooked and probably you you are rushing to animation and therefore you ignore it. So I just want to hear from you on the sentiments on why this is so important and 
just to make this answer more interesting, if you also can recall any moment where you had a different assumption for animation when you did not record yourself, but then the the capture gave you something more interesting that it's like a new discovery that, oh, wow, this is how it really happens when you, uh, when you uh, act it. Correct. Yeah, so yeah, basically the reference is going to give you that. So you might have an idea, let's say that somebody picks a can from the floor or let's say you need to animate a shot where a kid is uh, eating like an ice cream and a bit of ice cream falls uh, on, onto the shirt of the mom, right? That has, has like this. You can imagine that in your head and you can go and draw like some storyboard and try to describe how the situation is going to work. But if you have that in reference, you reference is going to show you some micro expressions. It's going to show you some details that will connect the audience directly. Some details that exist in reality that that will connect your audience to your animation. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to uh, actually. If you if you copy 100% the reference, it will look boring. You know, nobody wants to see a copy of reality. So you as an animator, you need to stylize reality. And as an artist, what we do is we stylize re- reality and show our version, our vision of reality. That's where it's interesting. So yeah, it's a it's a double-edged sword, I would say. Um, super useful if you know how to use it, like to build the skeleton of your animation, grab these details that are going to make your your animation have the, that touch, that spark, uh, but try to leave behind all the, uh, the, ev- the even timing, the monotony of reality, right? So you need to know, it's a super powerful tool, but you need to know how to use it. Um, that's, how, that's how I would de- describe it. Mm-hmm. And on a AAA project, uh, would it be the animators guiding the mocap artists to to enact a scene or is it like a game director or the specialist by themselves? Like how does it work? So for instance, in um, let's put the example, we use a lot of mockup in the uh, in the project that I'm working on right now. We have this incredible facility here in, in Playa Vista with like 200 cameras. It's like massive. It's it's so big. It's like a, like a tennis court, maybe bigger. And yeah, it's Activision uh, mockup stage basically. Um, so yeah, for first time, I got to direct uh, actors on on stage. That was super stressful. Uh, they they brought me five marines, <laughs> and I had to I had to direct them. Imagine, we have uh, we have a, a military advisor though that helps a lot. Somebody that has uh, in the team that has real experience, real combat experience, and yeah, you have like this number of people that take care of action capture. You know, like all the people that work in the stage. But yeah, I've been directing them uh, um, for first time, and yeah, that's what what we do. Basically, who they who tends to direct uh, the shootings uh, is my uh, animation director, and then my lead as well. But yeah, I've been I've been giving the opportunity for a couple of times, and usually it's like three days of shooting. You know, it's pretty much like a movie. We shoot for three days. We have everyone. You know, there's like the lunch. At, uh, everything is scheduled. And they are exhausting. At 4, 4.30, 5 p.m., when you're done, you want to go directly to, to bed. It's so exhausting. To Your brain is into overdrive, trying to think, uh, because you're shooting something that then you will have, you will need this data and put it into the game, and you will have to take care of that data. So, yeah, it's, it's an incredible experience, but very, very, very demanding. It, it leaves you completely dry, empty. When you finish a shooting, you're done. <laughs> Got it. My next question is about what are the projects that you are proud of? And you sort of answered that a bit in the beginning when you mentioned your your career journey. But could you think of uh, why any specific project was very special for you? Uh, something that that changed you drastically with your um, understanding of the the profession, your uh, quality of work elevated. What made it so special? So yeah, um, as I was pointing a uh, few questions earlier, I think that. Uh, one of the first um, projects that hit me uh, was Tron, Tron Uprising, uh, basically because it was animated on twos, you know. And when you animate on twos or when you animate on threes, it's like you have le- less words to put together a phrase, you know. But if you do it properly, it looks incredible. And it's something that I never, uh, as an animator, I never thought about it, you know. Like when they were drawing on papers, they they were 
animating on twos, on threes, just because it's uh, because if they draw every frame, they would never finish the movie, right? Uh, and doing that in 3D it blew my mind. It's like, wow, we're going to animate in 3D like this as well? That's amazing. Um, that was an incredible project. Um, Tearaway was an incredible project as well. Um, because if you think about it, we brought like this idea of animating on tools that I learned in Japan to England. You know, and the game is animated on tools, something that also matched very well this handcrafted um, aesthetic. Also, we 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 did uh, tear away like fifteen people. We were, it was fifteen of us. So, when you're working in such tiny studios, you cannot hide be, behind anybody. You know, like it's not like a studio of four hundred people. You know that nobody knows your name. Here, you're truly. Resp- I was truly responsible of all the animation in the game. You know, all the cutscenes, all the characters. So yeah, I felt that it had an immense impact in the product, and that makes me super proud. We also, you know, won so many awards. We went to we won three BAFTAs. It was as some of them are still hang here on my on my wall. So I couldn't be any any prouder. And it's just such a tiny game, right? But for me, it meant a lot. Uh, another project uh, that I feel very proud of, obviously Horizon. Uh, you know, that was my first AAA video game. Um, we were working on the game, as I was saying, and we we didn't know if it would be a success, if would, people would buy this idea of robot dinosaurs, you know, on a post post apocalyptic. <laughs> it's like, what are we doing? But yeah, uh, it turned out incredible. Visually, is incredible. And you know, something that I love is that most of the animation work that we did in 2014, like all the gameplay stuff. It's unchanged in the in Horizon 2. So that means that, you know, we did something right, I guess. Um, so yeah, I could keep going, but you know, uh, these three these three mm-hmm. projects, um, I they have a place in my heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, of all the kind of animation work that you do, is there any specific sort of work that you enjoy doing the most? Uh, like for example, when you are able to handle camera more. Or, for example, it's a bit more uh, like non-human character with a very cartoony proportion. Is there something that that just like gives you more excitement that you have more room to play with? So I think I'm I'm quite good at body mechanics. Uh, everything you know, like uh, characters jumping or fast motion or fighting each other. Uh, I think uh, for some reason I, I feel very comfortable animating this type of of shots or. Then I love cameras as well. Um, so yeah, it's like it's a little bit like being a director, being an animator. You know, they, they putting the cameras here and there, and you need to. And it's something that there's not really a, a, a course or like a workshop that you can do about cameras. It's something that you have in your in your mind because you've seen so many movies or you've seen so many uh, TV series. Uh, so yeah, I would say like in terms of animation, like. Um, body mechanics and yeah, working with cameras that that defines me yeah mm-hmm. and between the cutscene cinematics versus in-game animation is there any preference or both of them have their own magic i think they have their own magic yeah it's like uh good thing about uh, when you work purely on cinematics for games there's something really cool and is that you have a camera right so you can kind of cheat you it, you only see what you see in the camera, right? So that means that you can probably polish a bit more your shot and do things that if you turn the camera around, but they don't look right. Uh, gameplay, it's brutal. Gameplay needs to be perfectly animated from any angle, right? And, you know, there's like different challenges and rewards uh, on each um, on each field. Uh, I've done both, but I've done both, and I like both. And I keep do, working on both. Right now at Treyarch, I'm doing both. Um, so today I'm going to start the cinematic, by the way. Uh, but so for the last two months, I've been working with gameplay. I'm, I've been creating uh, enemies that I really want to... I, I'm, I'm looking for the audience to, to take a look at those and see what they think. They're pretty incredible. Got it. And I mean, now I understood what, what's exciting, but could there be something which is boring as well? Like it's something which is important to do in the business, but maybe not as creative or fun, for example, having to do some cleanup, skinning, or even addressing some feedback at a very 
micro level so are there these kind of things as I well i think that the biggest challenge and the frustration that you you get from games is um, again coming back to implementation like how much you have to fight and sometimes you need a lot of traction to put together an idea right so that can be the frustrating part of games and you know um, it's important to know how to deal with for instance what can happen in games very easily is that you're working on a feature for eight months, one year, even one year, and then it gets cut down. The market has shifted or the ideas of the creatives have shifted and it gets cut down, you know? So uh, that, could, that could happen. That could co- also happen in, in film, that, like an entire sequence of the movie gets cut down. Right? Um, but yeah, I would say most of the, the frustration that I get uh, from games is when you are you're working on something, you you know that this uh, could have an impact and could be good for for the game, but there's like different opinions around. Um, and yeah, you need to align and sometimes, you know, you, you need to fight some fights. There's some fights that you need to let go, you know. So yeah, implementation and, and basically bringing some features in, in, into the game. Um, can be cause for frustration. This is my frustration at least in games. Uh, but I think that overall, uh, as I said, I don't want to repeat myself, but when you see some of the stuff that you've been pushing finally make it into the game, it's fantastic. It's like a great achievement. Feels great. Um, this is more like a last question, but what would be your advice for animation enthusiasts who are trying to get into the industry? And if you can share more of your experience based on portfolios and because an animator can be making all wrong sort of portfolio and they could be thinking that yeah well it contains animation but only some experienced animators who are reviewing the work and know what was right to include what was not right to include and how you can really demonstrate something that can wow the hiring manager so is there any advice for you on on those fronts for for people who are building their portfolio? absolutely absolutely so um for people who is, uh, for instance, fresh from university or or not even going to university, but want to start, want to pursue a career in in feature films or uh, or video games, I think that something that we have now that we didn't have twenty years ago when I was when I was studying is like there's like a, a galaxy of online courses, you know, uh, that you can do. For instance, I animate, animation mentor. I don't know. Uh, there's like different names. Um, that will give you specific knowledge, and it's and they are taught by you know industry experts. And I really recommend these courses. Even myself, uh, you know, ten years ago I did one as a refreshment, which was facial animation. So that is going to help you a lot. And also, you're going to have uh, you're going to have some support while creating your short reel, which is the most important thing for uh, for an animator, right? So. Uh, and on some of these courses, at the end, they make you put together a, a reel and it's supervised. So um, the teacher tries tries to basically target, right? Because this is another important concept, target your your reel, t- target your portfolio. When I was, well, the, if I was looking back and uh, now preparing uh, for, the, for this talk, she does, and I was looking at my reels that I had like, I don't know, 20 years ago, and there's everything, you know, there's like modeling, <laughs> And there's like lighting, it's all over the place. Like nobody's gonna hire. So if you want if you want to find a shop as an animator, produce a, a super targeted animation uh, reel. If you want even uh, I'm gonna say more. If you want to be for games, target it for games. Or if you want to edit for films, for films. So that's what you need to do. And also, I mean, nobody's gonna give you anything for free, you know. You have to be very passionate. And work in your spare time. I remember my, the, the the reel that I had that got me the first uh, job in the street was full of tests that I was doing at home, you know, trying to improve myself. Uh, so yeah, for people that is trying, it's not easy. Uh, it's true that now uh, there's this hunger for content. So more there's more and more companies, people is consuming more and more games. So I would say it's easier probably now than it was 20 years ago. Uh, but yeah, you will have to be passionate and you will have to, you know, have faith and push yourself, keep creating, keep improving and target, target your, target your show reels to what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, fantastic. Luis, this was very, very insightful. 
And thank you so much for sharing your journey, your experiences, and your recommendations for people. Uh, I'm going to link you up in the description so people can connect with you if they, if they feel like asking something. But thanks a lot for spending this morning with us and have a great day. That was a blast. Thank you very much, Shiraj. Thank you.